So this morning's talk, as you know, poses the question, how fares the American dream? And uh, what is the American dream? Now, I think 95% of you expect me to be uh, uncontrollably optimistic about the dream. Uh, I am optimistic, but it's not uncontrollable. <laughs> uh, I have some reservations, and I'll share those with you. And, and what I'm going to do is, is give you a, a, I would like to think, a fairly solid historical analysis of the dream, okay? And then, and, and I will now and then uh, reach in, well, actually, I'll take out, I have a few cards here, which I'll read a few quotes uh, and of people who, what they had to say about the dream and so on. Uh, now and then, and, and then about, oh, I don't know, somewhere like 25 minutes or so from now, I'll, I'll move to the lectern, and then I'll, I'll, I'll read with you, for you, uh, some serious thoughts about where I think we're going with the dream, and give you my recommendations, and so on. So let me point out that the dream has meant thing, many different things to different people. That's one of my profound statements that I'll make today. It means different things. Uh, to some people, it connotes freedom, connotes equality, opportunity, owning a home, uh, having a new car, uh, having financial success, having fulfillment. It means all sorts of things. And this is a country made of dreams. There's no doubt about that. Um, and I agree with Senator Gregg. This is the best country in the world, and I will comment on that as we go forward. Um, so the, the American dream has been used in different settings. Scores of individuals, ranging from academicians, politicians, business leaders, folks in various walks of life have made reference to the dream. And we heard in the first video today, uh, Bill Moyer's interview asking different people about their dreams and so forth. What I found interesting, I might add, that two of the people Made the, fact, made the point that, uh, yeah, we'll have a, a dream if we have limited government. I found that interesting. And by the way, it's not in keeping with the American tradition, and I'll share that with you, why I think that. Um, and another one was, have the government stay out of our affairs, and I'll comment on that shortly. So, and it's been used in different settings, by the way. Um, there's a couple here from Cincinnati, and uh, they know we have a local newspaper, the Cincinnati Enquirer, very original name. Um, and the, um, when the Cincinnati Reds, the baseball team, won the National League uh, Central Division in 2010, the Cincinnati Enquirer had in its bold headlines on the front page, really bold letters, the great American dream comes true. Well, you know, it means different things to different, different people. So, uh, well, it certainly was the, the great dream of Bob Castellini, the primary owner of the Reds, but, you know, it's hard to say that it's the great American, American dream. So when I began my serious research this past year on the dream, I thought I would go to those scholars who've used the term dream. What do they mean by it? And I discovered that the first known scholar, now you better write this down because this is valuable information here. The first known scholar to use the phrase, the American dream, was Walter Lippmann. In his book, Drift and Mastery, published in 1914. And when he used the term, and he used it only once, he used the Term only one. Picture me now going through the book, see how many times you used it once. And when he did, he associated it with individual self reliance, individualism. He went on to say, The undisciplined man is the salt of the earth. This was his understanding of the American dream, what it meant for him. And he and many of his academic colleagues in the early 1900s concerned about the growing injustices, inequities in society at the time, believed that there should be more government involvement. They believed there should be some reform, some regulation of competition. And one of his colleagues was Herbert Crowley, who also wrote a very interesting book in 1909, five years before Lippmann's, 
entitled The Promise of American Life. Both Lippmann and Crowley, and by the way, the Republican President Teddy Roosevelt admired Crowley's book. Both of them, Lippmann and Crowley, believed that there should be more government involvement to correct some of these injustices in society, and both of them thought that no longer should Americans treat life as something that has trickled down to them. Let me repeat that. No longer should Americans treat life as something that has trickled down to them, totally. In other words, they were beginning to say what many have said since, you cannot expect individuals in our society to totally fend for themselves. Totally, okay? Now, so throughout the talk, we'll be talking about this tension between individualism, self-reliance, and government involvement. There has to be some sort of healthy balance, some people think. So, though Lippmann was the first one to use the term, it is widely acknowledged by the historical community that the historian James Truslow Adams, in his book, The Epic of America, published in 1931, at the time of the Great Depression, that James, James Truslow Adams popularized the phrase, the American dream. And he used it over 30 times in his book. And when he did, he talked about how the dream, though the term was not used until 1914, the concept of it was with Americans from the very beginning. And he went on to say that the immigrants who went to Jamestown in 1607, to Plymouth in 1620, the Puritans who went to Boston in 1630, these immigrants wanted, they were not only escaping economic problems in Europe, they were not only probably escaping religious persecution, but they came believing that they wanted a freer, better, and fuller life. That is how Adams, James Trussell Adams, would define the dream. The desire to have a freer, better, and fuller life. And so then, of course, he wrote about the Founding Fathers and their ideals and related that to the dream. And what he said was that the early immigrants and the Founding Fathers equated the American dream with the common people, the common folks. Very important point that he made throughout his study. And then he wrote about the, the Americans who lived in the 1830s. And this is what he said about the Americans who lived in the 1830s, and they relate to the American dream, okay? This is the first quote. This is what I do in class, by the way. And then I expect students to recite it. Oh, no, just kidding. This is what he wrote. At the low end of both the economic and intellectual scale, the common person's material needs were large. But the common man had his idealism. What he thought America stood for was opportunity, a chance to grow into something bigger and finer. Throughout the epic of America, James Truslow Adams pointed out that the dream was a great dream. Unlike in the stratified societies of Europe, where the wealthy ruled and the common people dared not dream, in America, he pointed out, the common person dares to dream. That is the essence of the American dream. And then he went on to say that this is probably America's greatest gift to mankind. He wrote as follows. The American dream is America's distinctive and unique gift to mankind. If America has stood for anything unique in the history of the world, it has been for the American dream. 
the belief in the common man and the insistence upon the common person having as far as possible equal opportunity in every way with the rich one. So as long as the dream, as long as the dream was part of the American culture, then romantic writers like Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, Walt Wiltman, these individuals would serve as inspirational figures for individuals to be self-reliant, to be as independent as possible. This was very important to, to James Trussell Adams' view of American history. Walt Whitman gave us a very, very good quote. He said, great poetry, like a great nation, okay? Great poetry, like a great nation, is the result of a national spirit, not the privilege of a polished and select few. Whitman wrote a great deal about the working man and the working woman in his poetry. In many ways, he was putting into words the authentic American dream. Very important. So when James Rosal Adams studied the presidencies of Thomas Jefferson in 1801 to Woodrow Wilson at the end of the First World War. He approved of their programs and approved of their, of their legislation. He thought this was very important. But then he was writing his book during the Great Depression. He was concerned about the survival of the dream. Many people today are concerned about the survival of the dream. He went on to say, if the dream does not survive, it means the failure of self-government. It means the failure of the common person to rise to full stature. But then he said, if the dream is to come true, those on top, financially and intellectually, they've got to devote themselves to the betterment of society. And those who are below, they should strive to rise, not merely economically, but culturally and spiritually as well. The very foundation of the American dream of a better and richer life for all is that all, in varying degrees, shall be capable of wanting to share in it. To make the dream come true, we must all work together. Adam's biographer, James Russell Adams did have a biographer, the late and renowned Alan Nevins said, yes, James Trussell Adams is definitely the historian of the American dream. As a matter of fact, James Trussell Adams was so excited about the American dream, he wanted to title his book, The American Dream. Not the epic of America, but The American Dream. So he submitted the idea to his publisher. The publisher said, no. Counter with the argument, who's going to pay $3 to buy a dream? <laughs> it cost $3 to buy a 400-page hardcover book back then. So, while James Truslow Adams approved of some of the reforms of Teddy Roosevelt and Woodward Wilson, he had very harsh things to say about the Republican presidents, Calvin Coolidge and Herbert Hoover. He believed that their programs, their policies contributed to the Great Depression. So it comes as no surprise to all of you here that when Franklin Delano Roosevelt ran for the presidency in 1932, that James Truslow Adams endorsed them. But what will come as a surprise to you, I'm fairly certain, is that four years later, he did not support Franklin Roosevelt. He did not like all the New Deal programs. He liked some, but not all of them. So he supported the unsuccessful presidential bid of Alf Landon, who no one else remembers. As a matter of fact, he wrote to a colleague this is what James Russell Adams wrote to a colleague in 1836 when Franklin Roosevelt ran for re-election. He said, you say Roosevelt is keeping the country moving. Well, he's given it diarrhea. <laughs> so Adams, very much committed to the common person, and he did not approve of laissez-faire economics, of individuals fending for themselves totally on their own. He was also for financial stability. He, was, he wanted to avoid excessive public funding. 
So I'm sure that part of James Charles Lowell Adams, Senator Gregg would like. And it makes good sense. So, and they, so, so if, what he applauded was the stubborn self-reliance of Americans as individuals. He definitely cared for the welfare of the common people, but to a limit. He did not want you know, the American dream at the expense of individual self-improvement, self-reliance, independence. But again, he did, not, he did see the need for federal planning, federal involvement. So now, as a historian now, we'll move away from James Strasbourg Adams. As a historian who has studied American history for half a century, that's a way of establishing credibility, <laughs> it is clear that the individual dream for a freer, better, fuller life has been present from the start. And it has been built, and, and in a sense, it has evolved from the hard work, the hearts and souls of millions of people who built this nation. And the dream has lured tens of millions of people from all over the world to come to America. In many ways, the story of America is the story of individuals of different creed, race, gender, ethnicity, and class trying to pursue a dream. That's the story of America. And historically, the concept was definitely conceived, as James Charles Adams put it, in the minds of 16th and 17th century Western Europeans who looked to America as the land of freedom and the land of opportunity. No doubt about that. And the Puritans, who, who landed in Boston in 1630, were the first to really make an impact on a generation of people. See, the American dream has, has in many ways, inspired generations of Americans. And the Puritans were the first to do so. And before they set foot on Boston soil, the first governor of Massachusetts, John Winthrop, said the following. We must delight in each other. Make others' conditions our own. Rejoice together. Mourn together. Work and suffer together. Always having before our eyes our community in the work our community as members of the same body. Now, the Founding Fathers, on the eve of the American Revolution, expanded the concept of the American dream. They conceived a society that would provide for the quiet, the security, happy enjoyment of life, liberty, and property. And we all know that in 1776, in the Declaration of Independence, they professed the self-evident truths that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. No words in American history are as popular or as well-known as those words. But again, we're all entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, not just to bear arms, we're entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And, and after they won their independence from England in 1783, they demonstrated a deep sense of a new virtuous nation being formed. And they, what they wanted was to, oblige, to, to invest authority in the people and establish a society that would benefit all. This was their intent. But as they proceeded, as they, as they espoused growth in farming and sometimes in commerce and manufacturing, this is what they believed. And what I'm going to share with you is the truth. This is what they believed. That human desire can never be permanently satisfied. Human desire has to have limits. And that's why they established a nation of laws and a balanced government of checks and balances, because man is imperfect. What they wanted was to establish a government to protect individuals from each other. 
because they believe that individual egotism, greed, corruption can derail a society. So they establish a government to protect individuals from each other. That was their intent. So this is associated with the Founding Fathers and the American Dream. So whereas happiness is one of the great joys of life, and we discussed that, we had dinner last night, and, and no, actually we discussed it in the car, come to think of it. Whereas happiness is one of the great joys of life, Jefferson believed virtue is the foundation of happiness. And a book that I alluded to last night is written by a philosopher by the name of Darren McMahon. And he wrote a book mysteriously titled Happiness. If you were to consult this book, he would point out that Adam Smith, the father of capitalism, believed that true happiness lay in tranquility and enjoyment. It had less to do with economic condition and more to do with the moral attitudes of the people in society. So the founding fathers then believed that in order to ensure greater morality in society, that we need to provide, people have to have restraints, but we also need to provide education. They believe that education can, can improve not only the betterment of the individual, but also the betterment of society. So Thomas Jefferson is famous for one of his great quotes, one of my favorites. He wrote to a colleague in 1783 about the importance of education to ensure the American dream, to ensure living true to our ideals. And this is what he said, preach, my dear sir, a crusade against ignorance the tax that will be paid to support the education of the common people is no more than one thousandth of what will be paid to kings and nobles who will rise among us if we leave the people in ignorance. The more uninformed the people are, the greater likelihood they can be manipulated and duped. What I found also disturbing in Senator Gregg's address today, but he's, I think he's correct, is the lack of content. The fact that we have all these sound bites and people just utter words. We have a, a role playing at Xavier. Uh, we have students at Xavier University who, this may come as a surprise to you, who are Democrats and some who are Republicans. And uh, so what we say is, okay, why don't now the Republicans you, take, you assume the role of the Democrats, and Democrats, you assume the role of the Republicans, and tell us what's wrong with America. It's amazing how articulate they are. They can do it. They just, it's very easy. Oh, I like taxes, or oh, I disapprove of taxes, so on. And the thing is, we don't go deeper into the, to, into the, to, to the analysis. So, so in our history, the concept of the American dream is strongly associated with an individual's effort to succeed by his own initiative. That's very much connected with the American dream. The, interval, the individual's effort to succeed by his own initiative. And early American romantics thought that every single person should act in accordance with his own talents, his own feelings. And they measure success in terms of personal growth and personal fulfillment. In the 19th century is when we got the age of industrialization. And people thought, oh gee, now the American dream can really be fulfilled. Because now a great deal of excessive work can be get, get, gotten rid of and invested in machinery. There was a person who wrote a book entitled The Paradise Within the Reach of All Men. It was published in 1833. The Paradise Within the Reach of All Men. And what he said was, machinery by re relieving people of excessive, unnecessary, burdensome labor, can lead individual, can, individuals can lead lives of, in, of great happiness. This was his belief about the power of machinery. So Americans invested a great deal of faith in the power of machinery. 
and later in the power of electricity to enhance the quality of life in society. But I'm reminded that in every generation, there have been these future-oriented views of the, of, the, of, the future, of the tomorrow. I'm reminding of a book entitled The Future of the Future. Now write that down. Uh, written by a, an artist and sociologist by the name of John McHale, written three decades or so ago. And in it, he has a quote. By assuming a future, man makes his present endurable and his past meaningful. By assuming a future, man makes his present endurable and his past meaningful. Now, you might enjoy knowing how I came across this book. I, it was on a late Friday afternoon. I was on the third floor of the Xavier Library. I lived a pretty dull life. And... Uh, I was going through the shelves and saying, hmm, what, what book I could read could be of interest to me for the weekend? And I came across that title, The Future of the Future, and really has made an impact on me personally and on my historical research. Because if a person's vision of tomorrow is promising, then a person can make a great deal, make many sacrifices and endure hardships. But what if a person's vision of tomorrow is the same? And what is stinks? then that person can become very depressed, demoralized. Very powerful, powerful statement. So what has been strong throughout the American story is this therapeutic notion that our nation's ideals are the most condu conducive to progress. Excuse me. Uh, as a matter of fact, through many moments like the Women's Rights Convention in 1848, the Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, 1863, uh, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech in 1963. All these moments indicate to us that people's rights in our society have increased incrementally. So, as Gerard Gregg alluded to, 150 years ago we had slavery. Then in 1865, slavery was abolished. So many more people had now had rights they did not have before. Fifty years later, women finally got the right to vote. Thirty, forty years ago, women, blacks, and gays were less confident about their rights than their descendants are in 2012. So rights have been increasing incrementally. That's a very encouraging sign about a society. So fundamentally, the American dream is about hope. The hope that every person of whatever status has the chance to be all that he or she can be. That each individual can design her or his dream. America's ideals, America's ideals of life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all will lose their luster, but also lose their meaning without the American dream. The American dream is part of our soul. Without it, America loses its vitality. This is incredibly important. So in light of the fact that the American dream is an exceptionally powerful concept, it is politically potent. America's political parties during the past 30 to 40 years especially have made reference to the dream. And both presidential candidates are making reference to the dream today. And the American dream does not belong to any one political party or group. It doesn't belong to the Democrats. It doesn't belong to the Republicans. It doesn't belong to the members of the Tea Party. It doesn't belong to the occupiers of Wall Street. I said that for Senator Gregg. Uh, it belongs to all Americans. And this is what, now I'm going to, let's see here, allude to a quote. Okay, let's see here. Okay. Allude to a quote by uh, President Clinton. This is what he had to say in his 
last State of the Union address, giving people a chance to live their dreams is not a democratic or a Republican issue. It is an American issue. All the presidents, from Reagan to Obama, have made use of the dream, have referred to the dream. And when they referred to the dream, they sometimes cited personal stories, they cited life lessons. This is what Reagan, uh, excuse me, this is what Obama said in his State of the Union address in 2011, that some of you may remember. The American dream is why I can stand here before you. That dream is why a working class kid from Scranton, you know, he was referring to Vice President Joe Biden, is behind me. That dream is why someone who began by sweeping the floors of his father's Cincinnati bar, referring to Representative John Boehner, can sit behind me. The first president, I know some of you are wondering, who is the first president to use the term American dream? Don't you really want to know that? Richard Nixon in 1970. And this is what he said. The American dream can be fulfilled only when each person has a fair chance. You sometimes you blindfold yourself and say, who said what? It's sometimes it's almost indistinguishable. Now, Reagan, and I will allude to this in a few minutes, in my judgment, gave us the best definition of the dream as a president. But he did say in his inaugural address, there are no limits to growth and human progress when men and women are free to follow their dreams. So notwithstanding the ideological and policy differences between the two parties, they have pretty much remained faithful to the concept of the dream. And the reason for that is it is politically potent. Now, what I also found, I won't say disturbing, but disheartening in a comment made by Senator Gregg was that in response to a couple of questions, says, well, that's politics. And if they want to get reelected and so on, I preferred, frankly, the comment that Bruce made in his commentary about who is the enemy. And he made reference to the people. So let me now go to the lectern and share with you what I think needs to be done to address the divisiveness of America and to preserve the American dream, okay? And, uh, and as I do this, you'll be patient Takes me a, minute, a few seconds to get to the rot. Okay, here we go. And I only have about 40 pages of reading with them. Just kidding. Just kidding. Um, oh. <laughs> I put this away here. Okay, so I'd like to conclude on this note. Oh, I can use this one now. Okay. From the beginning, America has been the story, as I mentioned, of ordinary people who dare to dream. I have grandchildren who are dreaming, and I encourage them to continue to dare to dream. And I'm sure you have grandchildren, you want them to continue to dream. Our nation was built on people's dreams and people's labors. As a consequence, the United States is the greatest bastion of freedom and one of the best countries the world has ever known. Notwithstanding recent troubles on many fronts, nationally and globally, America's ideals are still the best hope for people everywhere. We're still a potent force for liberty, freedom, and equality. We're seeing more and more people around the world exercising the right of self-determination and seeking those rights that foster human dignity. And I mentioned in, in my early remarks, the pursuit of the dream is inseparable from our nation's creed of individual freedom, equality, justice, and opportunity for everyone. And let me put it this way. Individuals are truly free 
when they're able and are active in pursuing their dreams. That's when people are really free. And those individual pursuits, collectively, constitute the moral and economic engines that drive this nation forward. The more freedom and equality of opportunities there are in society, the greater likelihood more individuals can pursue their dreams. Conversely, the less freedom and fewer opportunities there are, that much smaller is the number of people who are able to pursue their dreams. Don't you just like the logic that's used there? Okay. In my judgment, there is a direct relationship between the number of individuals who are able to pursue the dream and the health of society. The greater the number, the healthier is society. The smaller the number, the less healthy is society. So the American dream is an essential part of the glue that holds the nation together. That's why it is so politically potent. Politicians want to use that. In difficult times, such as during this period of economic uncertainty, people question if the glue can still hold the country together. While some argue that it's loosening, there are more people who still express faith in their ability to attain their dream. The surveys conducted by Xavier University's Center for the Study of the American Dream during the past three years show that for approximately 55% of Americans, the dream is still very real. However, most of them are worried about their children and grandchildren. They think it will be harder for them to achieve their dreams. Moreover, while many people are living the American dream, many are being left out. For them, the dream remains elusive. Many individuals cannot find work. Many individuals work harder for less. Millions of little security millions of little income, and millions have minimal assurance that they can afford college for their children or that they can afford retirement. And this is what Reagan said about the dream. My, I think, the best quote of a president on the dream. He said, the American dream is a song of hope that warms our hearts when the least among us aspire when the least among us aspire. And that person can start a new business, can find maybe new beauty in music, new beauty in literature, new, mu a new beauty in art, and that's how he explained the dream. In my judgment, Reagan's definition is entirely in keeping with America's promise of human fulfillment for everyone. Every individual has the right to live, to work, to be oneself, to attain fulfillment, and to become whatever her or his talent can be. Everyone should have a shot at the dream. Americans should not want equality of opportunity to be regarded as simply a well-intentioned phrase. A challenge in American life has always been how to balance individualism with the needs of all Americans, how to reconcile the rights of the individual and the larger social good. As one may hope that there can be a greater fusion of individual self-interest and the interests of the community, there will always be tension between individualism and the community. That's a tension that will never be resolved fully. It's part of the human condition. To live true to America's ideals, to the American dream, self-interest and self-reliance should exist side by side with teamwork and the good of the whole. Self-interest, self-reliance should exist side by side with teamwork and the good of the whole. As James Trudeau Adams said it very well, to make the dream come true, we must all work together. As we all know, there are sharp 
ideological and political differences in Washington. You're certainly very much aware of that given the six weeks of, of information that have been shared with you and given your own reading and study. Democrats and Republicans should put aside their bitter differences, work to expand opportunities for all people. Our politicians, like all Americans, should face the future as a united and not disunited people. They often advocate individual self-development, self-improvement, but they often disagree on strategies or on the role government should play in promoting opportunity and fulfillment. In keeping with the dream, individuals seek to be left to their own will, and there's nothing wrong with that. We want every single person to be a master of her own destiny or his own destiny. Hardworking Americans, enterprising individuals have always been important in the development of this country. But so has been the role of the federal government, such as in providing land grants to railroads in the 19th century that made it possible the construction of rail lines, the introduction of Social Security in the 1930s, the GI Bill after World War II to help veterans pursue their dreams, the building of interstate highways in the 1950s to improve the infrastructure and to stimulate the economy, and as we discussed at dinner last night, as you can tell, it was a very important dinner, as we discussed at the dinner last night, Title IX made possible for young women to be able to pursue their dreams. And look how successful they were in, to, in this year's Olympics. So the government has a role to play. We are living at a time where we're experiencing a revolution in time and space relationships. We're also seeing the, the digitization, the virtualization, the automation of more and more things. So the new technologies have thrust a new scale of life. So how can the American dream fare in this new setting? Well, one thing we should not do is romanticize the dream at the expense of, discuss of discussing real and divisive issues, such as the growing disparity in income, the shrinking middle class, as one person alluded to in her question, the national debt, the limited, availability of, the limited availability of essential goods and services to many people. Individuals' commitment to the concept of the American dream should want to take and face these real issues. Now, libertarians remind us that equality can restrain freedom and independence. It can deprive individuals of the possibilities of, of achieving their potential but there's a difference between equality of opportunity and equality of condition. While most people would not want or expect equality of condition, they want and expect equality of opportunity. We know that perfection is not humanly possible. America can never have 100% of equality and liberty. Nevertheless, we should strive continuously to find a healthy balance between individualism and community, self-reliance and government assistance. During the past year, Americans have alluded to the merit of the Second Amendment, the right of each individual to bear arms, and that is a right. I recommend, respectfully, that's when I get into controversial topics, you see. I recommend things respectfully. That we spend considerably more time discussing and debating our nation's other founding documents. Because the American dream and America's ideals of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are in danger. After winning independence in 1783, our founders, as I mentioned earlier, intentionally invested authority in the people. They did not put it in royalty, in the people, in the mass of the people. They establish a government of the people, by the people, for the people. Thus, as Bruce alluded to in his remarks, not quite directly, but this is what he implied, the federal government is the people. 
So the federal government, whether it's big, mid-size, or small, is the people. Therefore, the people are entrusted with the responsibility of living true to our ideals and the dream. A condition to placing authority in the people by the Founding Fathers was that the mass of the people would be sufficiently educated, not only to find jobs and careers, but to affirm and implement the ideals of the nation. But how knowledgeable are the American people about our history and the Founding Fathers' ideals? This past spring, Xavier University conducted a national civic literacy survey. Americans were given the same questions asked of immigrants who are expected to pass a civic literacy test in order to become naturalized. One in three Americans failed the test. The passing grade was 60%. If the passing grade had been 70%, two of three would have failed the test. Civic illiteracy, and this is what Senator Gregg to some extent was alluding to, the fact that we're not teaching civics or not teaching these essentials in our nation. Civic illiteracy is a threat to the American dream and a threat to self-government. Now, while more and more people should become more knowledgeable about our history and our founding fathers' beliefs, and we all have many different jobs, many things to do, it's difficult to stay informed, we should certainly expect our full-time representatives our elected officials to be aware of our founding fathers' ideals and not simply care about being re-elected politics for the sake of politics. Their primary responsibility should not be to be partisan for the sake of party loyalty or for popular approval, but act in accordance with those values that are in keeping with our heritage. They have a huge responsibility Acknowledging then that the people and their elected officials are imperfect, the Founding Fathers established, as I mentioned, a nation of laws and a political system with checks and balances. Wanting to protect individuals from each other, they argue that human desire had to have limits. And that the people, through their elected officials, had to impose restrictions on some aspects of human behavior. So our present situation calls for a renewal of commitment to the American dream. The American dream, as I mentioned many times, belongs to all Americans. And as James Truslow Adams said it very well, the American dream is identified with the common people, the poor, the middle class. It is America's greatest gift to mankind. It is a precious gift inheritance. Thank you.